I'm very humbled to be with this amazing panel, and I congratulate the organizers on the magnificent diversity represented here. And I want to, of course, give a special prayer for the indigenous peoples of this land all across the nation um, that we honor in special ways uh, at this conference. But I also want to thank Christy Brown for her vision in founding this, for Owsley Brown in carrying it forward, and for our wonderful hosts, Jim and Marianne Welch. And there's so many of you all on this staff. I have been immensely impressed with your generosity, your commitment. Let's give it up for those who must be very tired today, the staff. <laughs> So we're talking about this big word cosmology, but the way I like to think of it is just we're living within a universe story. Somehow people have done this for ages, but we're doing it again in a new way. That's the invitation here. So we need stories, clearly. It's what orients humans to the cosmos, grounds them to the earth. It motivates and inspires us. It awakens our imagination. It moves us to action and it gives us a sense of our place and role. And clearly yesterday with the panel on depression, that's one of the things, where is our role? Where's our place? We've had creation stories, of course, throughout human history. And this is represented in art. This is our Genesis story in the West for all the Abrahamic traditions, actually. But indigenous peoples have had their stories, their origin stories, the Hopi coming out of the Kiva, coming out of the ground and the earth um, to this earth. The Shinto creation myth is hugely important in Japan. You know, there was just a change of emperors and all of this comes back to the creation story of Amaterasu, the sun goddess, and the emperor until the Second World War was considered divine because of this creation myth, the Shinto myth. Now this changed, didn't it? Uh, with Charles Darwin and his origin of species, and we're still trying to get our minds around this. It's only 150 years old, that we're not just in a cosmos, but we're in cosmogenesis. Things are changing. That's a different thing. Of course, again, creation stories understood it, but in a very special way, through science, we're understanding it now. This magnificent 50-year-old photograph, December 68, also changed our vision. We're part of a solar system and a cosmos, Earth rise. Now, 10 years after that picture, Thomas Berry said, we need a new story that brings together science and religion, a story of evolution with awe, wonder, beauty, a functional cosmology that dynamizes human energy for the changes that we need, and this broader values and ethics that I'll be speaking about. So here is Barry, who passed away 10 years ago, a great inspiration to many people. He and Brian Swim did this book in 92, the first telling of a science and religion uh, new story. And with Brian, I did this Journey of the Universe uh, book. It's been translated into many languages, European and Asian. Um, and also this film, which some of you have had a chance to see, and we'd love to make it available to anyone who wants to use it, for your family, your friends, your institutions. Um, that's been on PBS here in the States. Uh, I was on Netflix, available on Amazon Prime, and uh, around the world. You know, it's very interesting. This is about evolution, and we never had a problem on PBS for three years. It's kind of amazing. Evolution with a spiritual twist? <laughs> I think we're making some progress, actually. <laughs> Um, but we also have these conversations, which we'd love to have you use, which are just about 20 minute interviews with scientists who are really empowered to tell us their part of this story, as well as environmentalists, which include things like eco-cities, eco-economics, how can we take this great story for the great work? And we've um, drawn on our wonderful colleagues of African Americans, indigenous peoples, and Latina in these interviews. So here's our context. We like to think of it as deep time, a 14 billion year evolutionary story. And we're right in this awareness of evolution and its beauty and complexity, as well as extinction, loss, which is partly why people feel so sad 
alone, not belonging. So we've got beauty and destruction interwoven, which has been the case throughout this 14 billion year process, by the way. We have these ecological social challenges, which the sad, bad news is overwhelming for people. But I do think climate change, we're moving towards eco-justice, biodiversity loss, we're moving towards restoration processes and things like biomimicry, as we heard yesterday, from pollution and toxicity to concern for food security, especially for our children, from consumerism to how can we live simply. All of this is about changing the dream of progress. Barry's idea was we need a new dream, the dream of the earth itself. So this is the age of the human, human-induced change all around the planet. Uh, so we're moving, as Barry liked to say, from a Cenozoic era, 65 million years ago, when the dinosaurs went extinct, to an Ecozoic era. Now, against all odds, and there's lots of bad mood, news, but what I'm trying to hopefully illustrate here is this move is being birthed and birth is difficult. So we're in a six extinction period. We are losing species, there's no question. But we're also awakening to this new intimacy of being part of a universe and earth community. We are stardust, and Carl Sagan said that so beautifully years ago. Um, so if we say we've come from the birth of stars, from a supernova, all the elements of our body. It's extraordinary, all the elements which have uh, generated life came from star uh, burst. So 10 billion years of universe evolution to eventually produce the unfolding of Earth and its systems. But that took as well 4.6 billion years to bring forth water and these life systems. The first cell on this planet was one billion years. One billion years before this first cell emerged and another billion years for multicellular life to emerge. Extraordinary. So then we have this explosion of plants, the diversity. This Louisville area right now is just singing, isn't it? With spring and its plants and flowers and trees. And the animals, oh, such incredible diversity, and as we know, they are also at risk. Um, and our human community around the world that has birthed our different societies and cultures, and a festival like this is celebrating that great diversity. So we know we're in a great transition moment, or as Johanna Macy talks about it, the great turning. So this sense of a breakdown to break through is where we are right now. Now we're living within this story. I'm gonna say it's a, we wanna make it a functional cosmology, an epic story, inspiring the great work, some of which we've heard about here, biomimicry yesterday, the organic farming movement. It's a living cosmology that's integrating this story for the transition. And again, the renewable energies that are bursting forth and the healing processes from indigenous traditions, from traditions around the world um, to give us the energy to make this transition. Now, here's what I would suggest is one of our greatest obstacles, that the enlightenment period from the French Revolution forward has given us life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, very individualistic, right? Um, but we need now this sense of the interconnectedness of all life. So ecology and the community of life is giving us interdependence, relationality, flourishing. And human connections to all of this are arising in new ways. So new values are emerging. Life is interdependence of all species. Liberty is relationality, kinship, all my relations, as the Lakota say. Happiness is living in a flourishing earth community with wellness, well-being. And we're moving, despite all odds, and in, amidst crashing conflicts, but we are moving from the nation state to a multicultural planetary civilization. One of the evidences is this from a declaration of independence to one of interdependence, which is the Earth Charter, which was birthed over almost 10 years, an amazing process around the world from the Rio Earth Summit. 
The preamble talks about a cosmology of this vast unfolding universe, but indigenous peoples on that drafting committee contributed this notion, we are Earth, our home, is alive. And they were weeping in 1972 when we were all there in Rio for the fifth uh, anniversary of Rio. And Gorbachev held up this declaration and indigenous people said, our worldview is in this declaration of interdependence. Which brings together ecology, ecological integrity, justice, and peace, an integrated worldview. So does the papal encyclical, this integrated ecology that he's calling for. So liberty in that encyclical is relationality, bringing together social justice and ecological ethics for eco-justice. And we have especially an explosion right now of grassroots movements for interdependence. The climate change march in New York, but Shell no along the Pacific Northwest, and they stopped that effort of Shell, amazing. And here, you know, we have to give it up one more time for these amazing young people, the Extinction Rebellion in the UK, Sunrise Movement here, Green New Deal, our Children's Trust, and Greta Thunberg. Can we give it up for interdependence? <laughs> This is so hopeful, it is so hopeful. So, just to conclude then, our ethical responsibility, what is it? This festival is embodying it in so many powerful ways. But we're widening our sense, aren't we, of care for humans and for the earth. We're broadening our participation in the whole so that awe evokes action, reverence inspires responsibility, and we have an ethics for the common good. And I'm going to end, as I do often, with the same beautiful quote that Owsley Brown began us with on Wednesday night from Einstein. A human being is part of a whole called by us universe, a part limited in time and space. He or she experiences himself, his thoughts and feelings as something separated from the rest, a kind of optical delusion of his consciousness. This delusion is a kind of prison for us, restricting us to our personal desires and to affection for a few persons nearest to us. Our task must be to free ourselves from this prison by widening our circle of compassion to embrace all living creatures and the whole of nature in its beauty. Let's give it up for Albert Einstein. <laughs> Thank you. Do you want this? No, no, no. They were screwed. Thank you, Mary Evelyn, for such a, and both enthusiastic and a sweeping overview of uh, our responsibility and our commitments in this regard. Before I have occasion to ask our panelists for some interaction regarding Mary Evelyn's remarks, let me open with this uh, question. Your uh, opening of this panel on wonder and awe, a conversation on cosmology and worldviews, suggests that we, in our contemporary phase and in all of our diversity and different cultures, are encountering some very old questions about the, the micro-individual, the microcosm of the person, and the macrocosm expressed in, in so many different ways in, in cultural depth and profundity. So this micro-macro interaction seems to be at the heart of your remarks, and yet, at, oh, early on, you mentioned the sense of dream or changing the dream. Is it possible to say something about this forward-looking dream that is itself calling us, or almost a new way of knowing that calls it into these new configurations? Well, thank you for that question. Um, it's really at the heart of a lot of things I think we're all thinking about, and that is, the human isn't isolated, clearly, John Dunn said that, but what does it mean then to expand our identity? Like the Confucian worldview is the individual is completely related to the other, to family, to society, to the educational system, political system, nature, and the cosmos. 
it's impossible to live without all of these concentric circles. And like a pebble in the pond, that's the fundamental relationality, deeply connected to, and no doubt influenced by, indigenous traditions. So the notion, even in Confucianism, is we have to cultivate ourselves in relation to all of these other groups so that our sense of, of being human is extended way beyond our own self and therefore we contribute to a common good. We can do this through our imagination. It's what indigenous traditions have helped us to do. We can do it through healing practices, prayer, etc. But we can do it also through action for future generations. And that's what the religious traditions have done. That's what telling a story, like a journey story, can also do for us. Thank you. May I invite any uh, comments or questions? So I think I really love your narrative as well. Um, I think at the end of the day, as you said, action is really needed because I think we need to have a sense of ownership, mm -hmm. a sense of belonging as well as sense of ownership. And I think the issue really often comes uh, about is that uh, for environment, for our human values, our common human spirit, I think it's the sense of ownership is important because nobody washes a rental car. Mm -hmm. And if people don't really <laughs> own it, I think it's really important that we have that sense of ownership, but hope is never a good strategy. I think we can hope that the government and other people will really come together, but I think the most important thing is that all the great people in this room and also who are really working very hard to change the world, we may be tiny little snowflakes, but you put it together, it becomes an avalanche. I wanna sort of, the idea that we have to take ownership, which I agree, but it, for me that also means we have to take responsibility. Right. And this is often the place that's really hard because as human beings, I don't, want you, I don't wanna take responsibility for the things I don't like, but I have to do that. And what does that look like? How do we do that? How do we move forward? There's mm. more I can say about that. Though. Well, you know, what's coming to mind for me is in my own community, well, and, and really at Standing Rock. Standing Rock mm -hmm. was yes. a very clear example of a lot of elements that had never really come before in that way on the planet, or I don't know if I can say on the planet, but not in, in recent memory. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and I know at home, you know, I think yesterday I mentioned that we have this water issue going on where they want to drill these 14 deep aquifer wells in this... 20 mile square area, um, and this is gonna keep coming up. And so what the young people in my community who are at Standing Rock learned was that um, there's no way for one person to address that. Um, you know, our, our, our systems are not set up right now for life, frankly. They're set up for, with, a, with, a pri with other priorities. Mm -hmm. And so as we begin to notice what's happening to our life, we have to keep uh, pressing up against these systems that are not really equipped to deal with what's, what's, what's occurring around us. And really that's gonna take, all, it's gonna over and over again, it's gonna take masses of people saying, hey, um, this looks like we're heading off the cliff and you know, what do we do? So, so, uh, so that community, you know, is, is, is critical. And what I'm watching in my home is just, it's, it's so amazing. Since I've been here, um, everybody got very tired um, and people were starting to disband and they, you know, I was getting all the email, the, the text threads of them saying, let's have a cookout tonight. Let's go all soak in the springs and remember what we're doing. And um, so not only is it, has it been like this, you know, the, the, the old activists, everybody coming together, but, but it's really recreating family in the most powerful way mm -hmm. and bringing together all factions of the community for, for life. We mm -hmm. all need the water. Yeah. So life calls us forward, but it calls us forward with this sense of communal responsibility uh, and for engagement that finds uh, feet on the ground and hands reaching out to take hold of the work. Uh, is there a further comment, Mary Evelyn, you'd like to make? Well, that? these were all terrific, and I just really wanted to pick up on the last one because that slide's going to go in the next <laughs> version of this because I think Standing Rock is the most remarkable okay. example of this, yes, really, incredible, incredible. And 
Everyone was watching it, right, who cares about these issues, because water is life, was central to it. And young people and doing the rituals and keeping the fire going, that was central to it. And it attracted, of course, people from all over the world, indigenous people, but more than. Mm -hmm. And to me, it was one of the signal moments of our time, of the power of the earth calling us forward to say water is sacred, life is sacred. So thank you for really bringing that into our conversation. Excellent, excellent start.